Selling out. It's been the topic of the show all season long. And here we are, what, episode 36? And we're still focused on selling out and, of course, being sold out. From selling our souls with our opinions to literally selling your souls so your podcast becomes popular. <clears throat> this episode looks at how we sell out and how we are sold out on the Internet. We've talked about the legislation that's just not there to protect we the people from ourselves. Now let's talk about ourselves. Our own personal responsibility in this social downfall. Like it or not, we've all contributed to this. We've let this happen. We've compromised somewhere along the way. How many of us could pass a purity test? So let's take a look at just how deep this goes and what it would take to turn this anti-social media ship around. After all, Rome's ablaze. We can just log into our Nero app and tap, tap, tap the screen and make fiddle noises till our dopamine receptors are so overloaded only a bar fight of B.A. Baracus badassery would satiate the constant craving for content. Or we can reach for a hose and try to put that fire out and salvage anything that might be left in the charred decay of our overindulgence, oblivion, and ambivalence. And welcome to the podcast. It's just not something we pay much attention to. Yet that fine print always bites us in the back when we ignore it. <laughs> Look at all the myths, legends, stories, and tales. It's a running theme throughout history. Transcending cultures. How on earth don't we get it? Read the fine print. Still, just like I've spoken about in the last few episodes, we just click the box to move on with the fun with no concern for the consequences or the cultisms we're subjecting ourselves to and our children. When was the last time you read an instruction manual? <laughs> For me, that's kind of tricky because my brain sort of assimilates information and I work on a lot of context clues. My wife gifted me this automatic pepper grinder. I toss the directions and the box without even considering I might need them. I can look it up online, worst case, I thought. But still, I powered through it. I got it figured out pretty fast. I don't take for granted everybody can do that, but it's just sort of how it works. Batteries go here, this twists there, I'll turn it just hard enough to see if that's where it comes undone, and boom. I had a custom mix of peppercorns of my choosing. Personally, I prefer proportionally more pink peppercorns, but then again, that's personal preference and <laughs> me being particularly picky about pepper. Yes, I could have just as easy turned this pamphlet around and, and looked at this visual aid of instructions had I not chucked them without thinking. I, I could have saved, what, four or five minutes tops? Honestly, it's more like two or three probably, but hey, I'm a sucker for a puzzle. When it comes to online things, I think we do that too. We rely on the context clues. We chuck the instructions in the bin because, well, who has time for that? We just sort of accept our fate as it is and move along. We chuck those instructions out before we even read them. We'll figure it out as we go along, right? And I hate to harken back to history, but in the progress of board games, I dug into the origins of Monopoly. Now that game is to blame for all this too. We disregarded the most sacred institution of any game we play. The rules. We ignored those lengthy, if this, then that, blah, 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 instructions to the board games and made up our own house rules. That Look, that became such a thing that they started printing the how-tos on the box so kids wouldn't lose them. <laughs> look, we didn't lose them. We just didn't want to bother reading them or following them. The rules weren't important enough to keep. They weren't valuable to many of us. I'm just saying we the people have never really been great at attention span and we sort of like to Laverne and Shirley things. Doing it our way. <laughs> well, there's nothing we won't try. We've never heard the word impossible. And this time, oh, there's no stopping us. Doing it our way. <clears throat> Which could really mean anything when you're playing with Monopoly and, and playing with strangers. Have you ever just passed go and gotten more money and it's like, um... It's only supposed to be $200. And they're like, oh yeah, but we play it with 400. It's just more fun that way. Oh, and if you land in jail, you just miss one turn. And if you land on free parking, you get all the, uh, 
know what I mean? We just make up our own rules. However, rules of games is where our integrity is stored. Remember some of what we talked about in this whole show as far as compartmentalizing in our brains and how we store data and, and how that's closely tied to uh, trauma or indoctrination, learned or taught behavior. So if games and sports is where we center a lot of our values of fairness, right and wrong, good sportsmanship, ethics, integrity, respect for rules, well, <clears throat> when the foundations of our values becomes fluid, everything becomes fluid. We've compromised our integrity over and over with these slight, seemingly harmless areas, these little things we may not consider as important because they're just games or it's, it's just social media. So now, when we just change the rules in the middle of the game, nobody bats an eye. Whatever that game is, it doesn't matter. Rules schmools, am I right? Well, <laughs> rules matter. That's how games work. But with rules, there also come the terms and conditions, the consequences, so to speak. This is what you get. This is what they get. This is what happens when you win. This is what happens when you lose. These games, our opinions, attitudes, how we treat others, those games, my friends, <laughs> are not just for entertainment purposes only. These are the high stakes games, spinning that roulette wheel round and round, and does it stop on red for the fiery pits of sinful devil hell or black for the dark abyss of nothingness? <laughs> <sighs> Sounds like a lose-lose, right? Gambling usually is. Well, <laughs> welcome to social media, where those terms and conditions may apply to some, but not to all where the fine print isn't always disclosed and the unintended consequences are mental trauma and sociocultural shifts that redirect the course of humanity. In the previous episode, I covered some of the basic history of tech. Computers, the internet, social media. That's important, of course. Timelines and those sorts of facts can be fascinating. But I'm leading up to my next episode, the great social media experiment which chronicles my own journey through social media and my deliberate attempt to manipulate my own algorithms, friends, followers, and fans for the sole purpose of researching these points I'm discussing. I'm not the only person to have discovered the power of the internet and what's valuable, but I've always been more fascinated with the less glamorous side of winning. Maybe, I think, if I'd invested time into being successful instead of studying how so few are and how so many give so much of themselves to contribute to that while most in that equation are left holding the debt, well, maybe it would make bigger headlines when I have a book come out, but maybe I wouldn't have to self-publish, huh? By gods. I wanted to observe people's real and genuine reactions more than anything. I've mentioned this before, but it applies here too. Years ago, a dear friend of mine, a mentor, whom I respect, pleaded with me to stop arguing with people online. He said it was bad for my image and that I was only harming myself and I wasn't changing any minds. I respectfully disagreed. What I couldn't disclose to him at the time was that I was trying to change minds, my own. I had a hypothesis I needed to test. This hypothesis is at the center of my claim about the deliberate and strategic dumbing down and numbing down of our society. But this hypothesis had to do more with personal, individual responsibility than it did the systematic issues that led to it. Those became apparent the more I researched and read up on some of the psychological brain science stuff. I could be a lot more technical, but really, who's not going to tune that out? Suffice to say, I connected some dots that led me to believe that if no one saw this coming, that's negligent on a much bigger scale than we've ever seen. And that's saying something. If this was something we knew and just ignored, like climate change, then we deserve to know why. I know how this sounds. It sounds like I'm damning social media technology. Uh, and maybe calling for us to roll back progress to a simpler time? In a manner of speaking, I am. How do we truly, at this point, 
in the thick of it, pragmatically assess the pros and cons of the information age. The rules of that game keep changing faster than we can keep up. Don't even bother printing it on the box. That PDF never getting printed. Figuring it out as we go along doesn't work for the people playing the game, but that seems to be how those who made the game have carried on. But who makes the rules? Who enforces the rules? And where is any of that benefiting us? The fact is that social media isn't governed or regulated in the ways maybe it should be considering the drastic impact it's had on our culture. Not just in America, but for the world. For all the legislation passed, most of it is there to enable big everything to target us, manipulate us, market to us at any age, at any time, all the time. And for all the legislation passed, of course, I mean what little has been done and then what very little has been done to protect children. Now, imagine what it would take to unwind all that damage. To look back at 1981 and realize the cataclysmic error of our ways and to say no more marketing to children the way we do. We must respect the science of human development. <laughs> that would be a cultural shift seen by many as a devolution. That might cause an uprising. Have you ever turned the TV off when a toddler was watching it? <laughs> well, congratulations, y'all. For 40 years plus, we've contributed to the raising of generations of spoiled toddlers, impatient, petulant, whiny, entitled toddlers. And social media is our binky. Parents, how many of you know what your kids are doing on their phones? Tablets, laptops, gaming systems. I would wager a bet that a huge portion of their media intake comes from social media rather than traditional media. Put one of your sticky notes on this point. We'll come back to it. The under 30s consume media much differently than those 80s babies did or even do today. Having come up in the 80s and 90s, I was there to see network transition to cable. Cable to satellite, back to cable, uh, Betamax, Laserdisc, VHS, Super VHS, Mini VHS, DVDs to streaming. <laughs> to the consumer, the differences between network television, cable television, and streaming are chasmic, but yet not all that dissimilar on the surface. Not different enough to notice, unless you know how different they are. The terms and conditions of that consumption or the differences were never fully disclosed, though it's safe to suggest the dangers were known. That's why some of that content was put behind a subscription paywall. It was the release of liability for any harm caused by consumption. You paid for it. It's on you. Caveat emptor. Buyer beware. Let's take traditional network television, as we've discussed previously in other episodes. TV signed on and signed off. There was a time when TV was on and a time when TV was off. News was at these times and clearly labeled. They often offered some editorialized content, but that was clearly differentiated between the news and not the news, sandwiched between sports and weather. There were clear boundaries set by the FCC, or at least, at least upheld by the FCC. The thing about the FCC is that George Carlin's Seven Dirty Words was just a comedy bit. In fact, you could say any of those words on broadcast radio or television and get away with it until someone complained. That's the issue. The FCC held the responsibility of broadcasting somewhat sacred in the sense that you just couldn't get on the radio or TV and be vulgar. The idea was everyone with a TV or radio had access to broadcast, so they had less of a choice in being exposed to certain things. We've been focused a lot on the mid-1990s and previous episodes leading up to the social media explosion. There may not be a better example of what I'm talking about with obscenity and decency and crossing that line on broadcast television than Martin Lawrence. Martin Lawrence is a comedian known for his show Martin and movies like Bad Boys with Will Smith and Big Mama's House with Martin Lawrence in a fat suit. Martin was a comic whose career hit its stride on the heels of Eddie Murphy's plateau and before Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, or Kevin Hart would really take off. 
While Martin's set wasn't altogether vulgar in the setting of a comedy club or a cable comedy special, a few particular bits in his set, some of the most popular, were centered around homosexuality and women's lady bits. Well, <laughs> all genitals, really. Look, I'm not saying his bit wasn't funny. As a young comic, I admired guys who were willing to say it bluntly and raw. I was a young man, so I admired guys. Lots of toxic misogyny, so my judgment was clouded. But in 1994, Martin did this whole bit live during his SNL monologue. They didn't cut away or anything. That's the thing. They could have. They chose that the show must go on. I think that's important. The show ultimately had the choice to let it continue, and they did that. We'll get to it. Behind the scenes, Martin was told dead to rights he could not do this and that bit during his monologue. He could host SNL, but he had to play by SNL's rules. Well, that's like telling a child you can't do something. I'm not knocking Martin Lawrence necessarily. I understand all too well the temptation to speak your authentic truth, but it cost him. SNL banned him from ever appearing on the show again. Now, Andrew Dice Clay, one of the most offensive comedians ever, compounded by the fact that he just wasn't even funny, just really offensive. He was booked on the show in the 90s, and that made cast member Nora Dunn walk off in protest. SNL would fire her for that the next week. Sinead O'Connor tore up a picture of the Pope and got banned. Nirvana had a makeout session with each other. Samuel L. Jackson let an F-bomb drop. Garrett Morris mocking the hearing impaired. <sighs> SNL was no stranger to controversy. In fact, maybe one could argue the controversy has carried them as much as the characters at times. But Martin went rogue. Just like Elvis Costello did in the 70s when he switched to uh, Radio Radio mid-song. A song the bigwigs at the Peacock said no to being played on SNL. Martin went into a bit about the Bobbitt scandal, Google it, another gem from the 90s, then went down to toilet humor. No, literal, actual toilet humor. It was gross. Not unfunny at the time, but just gross for network TV. The FCC had been involved with SNL before, and the show probably avoided a bigger dust-up with the FCC by immediately taking action. Still, the damage to the viewer was done. You let the tiger out of its cage, and then you're shocked when it snaps its leash and Siegfried's a Roy in the audience? Network television didn't have much of a filter, but the filter network television did have was at least somewhat effective. Until cable TV. Cable, a subscription service, played by different rules. Since you paid for the service, they weren't beholden to the same rules and regulations as traditional broadcast media. Even though technically, cable is casting broadly, the term broadcasting desperately needs an updated definition. Cable could say some of those dirty words. But if you wanted to hear the real dirty words, you had to wait until after 11 and see the real dirty stuff. <laughs> HBO, Showtime, and Skinamax. Premium pay cable, baby! So from a certain perspective, our television media has been broken down into paying to unlock certain filters. If you wanted network TV and everything's G to PG rated, maybe PG-13, that was free. If you wanted to see shows a little more real, like rated R, then pay a little. If you wanted to see real real, like NC-17, pay a little more. By the time cable packages hit into the hundreds of channels, we began to see the rise of the internet. It'd only be a matter of time before... What exactly? What did we think would happen? Cable at least had still some filter on it. Not much of one, but at least a subscription filter, at least a parental advisory filter. At least you had to be home, sitting down, changing everything you do just to consume it. Right, then streaming. With streaming, we were all handed all of our favorite classics and new original programming that didn't have those silly hindrances of broadcast or even cable. No, streaming was its own separate little slice of broadcast media because it's not considered broadcast. Only AM, FM, UHF, and VHF are broadcast. Most don't even know what those letters mean. And is it really even important anymore? Radio and television. 
Legally, legislatively speaking, that's broadcasting. You see, to consider anything else broadcast, even though it does cast broadly, would eat into the pockets of wealthy people because then they would have to be under the Federal Communications Commission. Those arguing for a smaller government, they're usually the ones trying to get away with something. Remember that. Video rental services and cable evolving to streaming is another episode, I'm sure. But the transition from cable to streaming as far as what it's done to we the people, that's what we're talking about here. America, again, had her big three networks. We just went from ABC, CBS, and NBC to Netflix, Prime, and Hulu. Then, just like with cable evolution, if you want to call it that, niche channels started popping up. Disney+, Plus, Apple TV, Paramount, Peacock, Live TV, Network TV. Some of these offer that as well. Cutting the cable cord? Never been easier. It's just that Well, like I discussed with MySpace, our cable got deconstructed and placed a la carte on a build-your-own buffet. Still, we didn't get home shopping or televangelism shoved down our throats non-consensually, but our cable bill went up, not down. Now we had six services at 15 bucks a pop and still nothing to watch. I realized things had shifted several years ago. When my teenage daughter tossed me her Xbox controller, exhausted from constantly reviving me on Call of Duty, no doubt, and then she said she was going to go upstairs and lay in bed and not watch TV, not watch Netflix, certainly not listen to the radio, who does that anymore, but watch YouTube. YouTube jumped in quickly to become another streaming service. Sure, there are premium YouTube services for TV and stuff, but what we didn't think about was that YouTube is a streaming service. That the videos, whatever you're consuming, is TV. It might not be great TV, but it's TV. You're watching TV. It's just free. YouTube, Twitch, TikTok, Snapchat, hell, I'm over 30, so I know I forgot a dozen or so, I'm sure. What do any of them have that radio and television doesn't have? Content. A variety of content, searchable, Content, instantly available, easily consumable, conveniently customizable content. What your teenager wants to see, when she wants to see it, and what she didn't know she wanted to see until after she saw it. It's an on-demand world, and if you're making them wait, they'll find it faster and better somewhere else. Another big reason audiences are flocking to alternative forms of media, over broadcast, like radio and television, is personalities. America loves creating heroes. Social media gives us the power to make or break celebrities daily. We finally have the button to vote contestants off the island. But for all the everybody gets a show and the accessibility of platforms for people to buy enough followers to get to go live, you've got the same multi-pronged problematic pendulum that has killed radio and TV industries. One social media refuses to learn from. Talent is uncoached. Uncoached talent quickly becomes uncoachable. Programmers, program directors, what have you, who aren't talent coaches, they don't groom celebrities. I know, grooming, but that's what the word's supposed to mean. Radio specifically needs celebrities. Imagine the influence power of celebrity. We're all subject to it, if even subconsciously. Celebrity endorsements work. That's why companies spend millions of dollars investing in them. So why wasn't radio and TV, and especially social media, committed to creating these celebrities, these cash cows, even today? Without those well-coached, trained, experienced professional communicators, not just personalities, not just talented people or not talented people, not just anybody with no filter, anger issues, mental or emotional issues, but trained, experienced, professionally coached communicators. We're going to experience an exponential devolution on par with 1981's deregulation. And those are the hidden fees we don't really discuss. Just as with network TV once shielding us from offensive and problematic exposure, and even overexposure to network TV itself, then keeping up with the pressures of the competition to go 24 hours, 
and compromise their programming to the trends rather than the public's best interest. The social evolution of media has come full circle, removing all of the gatekeepers of the broadcast airwaves. The government agency that oversees them, the station owner and manager for the most part, and, and really any boss, hierarchy, accountability, structure, or any of the fucking guardrails whatsoever. Placing every single bit of the responsibility of broadcasting to the masses in the hands of each and every single person with an internet-connected device. The free market should determine success in America. No government should stand in the way of prosperity and the fulfillment of the American dream. I'm paraphrasing what Ronald Reagan and his new FCC chief Mark S. Fowler said in 1981 about eliminating the restrictions on what companies could, should, and would be able to directly manipulate children into pestering their parents to buy. Republicans said they believed that it wasn't the government's place to stand in the way of a toy company creating a cartoon for children with the sole purpose of selling them toys. Republicans said they believed it wasn't the government's place to stand in the way of a snack cake manufacturer to manufacture snack cakes that are pure sugar, addictive, and appealing. And then that government had no business telling that company that they couldn't pay a children's television program or host to eat those snack cakes in their show every day. Now, granted, this is one of those things where, yeah, but both sides applies. But that's not until we get to the late 80s. This one, all Reagan, all the GOP. And it was deliberate. The costs of that action are becoming apparent today as we see more and more of the influence of social media on our culture. Those terms and conditions must have been the finest print because none of us saw them. Or if we did, we didn't heed the warnings. The hidden fees and the auto-renewal of cultism. The dumbing down and numbing down of America. There's an old saying about the internet. Well, not very old, obviously. It's about the internet. But pop culture cliche nonetheless. The internet never dies. Well, there are many ways to express the sentiment that if it ever existed online, it's there forever. It never truly gets deleted. That's not always the case, but it's a safe bet when picking up a digital recording device of any kind. Personally, I say all kinds of horrible and terrible things into this thing when no one is around just to keep anyone listening truly absolutely in shock. Just like we've seen with cancel culture, if someone wants to bad enough, they can find something. So let's just think about that and what that means. Any and everything you've ever said, done, typed, or clicked is in your digital history. That's your fingerprint. Shine a black light over the internet, that's where your DNA is. Everything. And the internet is smart. If you think you can run and hide, you can't. If you think you figured out a bypass, you haven't. If you've read online how to get away with something, know that information was put there by people who want to catch you doing the thing. <laughs> the internet knows all. The internet is artificial intelligence. It's like Santa Claus. You tell it what you want, maybe you'll get it. It knows when you've been sleeping. It knows when you're awake. It knows when you've been bad or good. It's always watching. Scared yet? Well, it's got you pinged to a unique GPS IP ID locator. You're tagged whether you want to accept it or not. We've all been chipped. Social media just makes it much easier to profile us and learn everything we already freely give away. That's what you've done, you know. You've built an online digital fingerprint, a portfolio, a profile that we've talked about before. You've spent years and years of your life online cultivating that data, farming it, nurturing it, and watching that data grow. That valuable consumer asset that we aren't being compensated for. Us, our data and what it means to everyone involved, including us. Our data. 
where we go, what we do, what we click, what we choose. It's all right there, ones and zeros. It's one of the few binary things in this world. We simply are connected to the internet. Therefore, our digital data fingerprint isn't our own to own. Or were woodsmen, those rare emancipated self-proclaimed freemen, sovereign citizens living off the grid, storming capitals and whatnot? <laughs> You're a one or a zero in this regard. You either have all of your identity and, well, every fucking thing about you is out there and owned by uh, whom? Or you have zero digital fingerprint. Good luck finding one of those unicorns. We're all online, connected like Johnny Mnemonic, wired into the mainframe like a Borg. We are the Matrix. We collectively have created, enabled, and emboldened the biggest cultural shift and mental health risk in America. Social media. In the next episode, I'll get more into my actual journey on social media and how I've manipulated that for answers. That's right. Answers we already knew, but like, now I know, no. You know? What I've discovered is reinforced with the scientific data and other sources which tell of... This is going to sound rude, but since when have I cared? <clears throat> A lobotomy on society. I know you wanted more buildup, but that's it. All of your kids' anger issues? Social media. Internet... Connectivity, digital devices, all of it. Look, even the childhood trauma that isn't them sitting in front of the brainwashing machine for hours a day, I can promise you it ties right back into it somehow. Six degrees of separation, more like one. Everything we know runs through the fiber optic lines of the internet and pop culture entertainment media. It's touched literally everything. So let's take a really strong look at the words some people use to describe kids these days. Entitled, lazy, impatient, apathetic, oblivious, arrogant, unrealistic. Surprised that all these words line up with traits fostered with the use of social media and the internet. Entitled, it's easy to suggest that children, even those in the 40 and under crowd, have issues with feeling like some things are just a given. We never knew a time before microwaves, instant oatmeal packets, ice makers in the freezer, garage door openers, remote controls, video games, pizza delivery, mass produced and readily available in everything on demand. Now do that for the 30 and under crowd, the 20 and under crowd. The turn of the 20th century was literally the dawning of a new day for America. The turn of the 21st century was the same, with Y2K, 9-11 right around the corner. Things changed, like it or not. The internet wasn't this fad that would just stop working and crash the world. It actually didn't crash when the date flipped from 99 to zero. So if this isn't going to crash my computer in the whole world, well, what the hell, let's download all these songs for free. Yeah. Not sure why anyone would accuse the younger generation of being entitled. Everything has been handed to them. Mass produced. Nothing is special. Special is volume. Don't give me expensive. Give me a lot of it. Remember when we talked last episode about the gaming consoles and how the first major console sold 300,000 units, period? Nintendo's current gaming system sold like 917 million units? We went from, oh, wow, your parents have video games, to, <laughs> you don't have video games? What are you, poor? <laughs> the haves and the have-nots sort of flipped. But this happened in such a short period of time, as commercialism was taking off leaps and bounds and corrupting our decision-making and critical thinking, our compassion and empathy. And we got the stuff. We kept up with the Joneses, or the Joneses kept up with us but we were never really taught how to appreciate the thing, whatever it was we were so desperate for. On the surface, it seemed like the opportunity for everyone. It wasn't just the wealthy elite that got the nice things to enjoy. 
They did for a while until it got affordable for the rest of us, and by that time, they were bored with it, so who cares if the subjects have what we don't want anymore? And we went from Christmas being realistic to Christmas being about stuff pretty quickly. We also went from all that expensive stuff, being the big birthday or Christmas gift, to getting the thing as soon as it comes out. Standing in line for hours and hours to make sure we get the thing first. We win! It's instant gratification. Impatient. Well, who could figure if people would grow more impatient when you give them everything they ever wondered about a click away? When everything can be delivered, dashed, grabbed, and eventually teleported, who has time to wait? We didn't watch Willy Wonka close enough. I want it now, Daddy! Veruca wasn't the hero of that story. Lazy. It's hard for me to defend poor work ethic, but how do I honestly look at a kid in the eyes today and say, no, get a job, kiddo, do the thing and cash that check and good things will come? And don't worry, your boss will take care of you. No, that isn't the world I grew up in. And I don't even know if that was really the world my dad grew up in either. Like most of America, that works for some people, but not all. What some might see as lazy, I might offer as resigned that no matter how hard they work, the reward isn't much different. I was in a relationship once with someone I just could not make happy. Nothing I did was right. If I didn't do the laundry, I was a selfish, lazy son of a bitch. If I did the laundry, I disturbed her sleeping, or it was just always something. If I did something, I didn't do it right. If I changed the way I did it, it was still wrong in another way. Sometimes wrong in the same way, which was just maddening. Eventually, I stopped. I came to realize that the end result was the same. The odds of her having a good day were slim to none, and I usually got yelled at for something. So if I'm going to have my entire day ruined, then I'm going to choose to spend the time I do have in peace doing what I want, playing video games. What happened was the self-fulfilling prophecy where rather than addressing her own issues and then being grateful to have a partner who took initiative to do stuff, she berated and beat that man down to the point that he just sat in his office alone with the door shut and headphones on, losing himself on a make-believe football field. Well, at least there I got my ass kicked by choice. The younger generation kind of has a similar conundrum with the old paradigm of work hard and it will come. They just don't have tangible evidence of that being true. The rich got richer in my time, and that rich got even richer in Gen Z's time. Apathetic. Now, I think these lead into one another. Apathy is a byproduct of seeing your efforts go for naught. It's hard to care when nothing seems to matter. How do you show passion when your passions are mocked, ridiculed, and denigrated? How do you thrive and strive when you're pushed into a path usually not entirely of your choosing, and the path maybe you really wanted to take, one where your gifts were more aligned with, wasn't one that would have been taken seriously? When you're told you suck and everything you like sucks, why even care anymore? How do you stand up for something when all you've been told is to sit down and shut up? That you should be seen and not heard? Just look pretty and hush now. Shh, the adults are talking. You'll understand when you're older. Oblivious. Like it or not, kids and young adults are smarter than we think. They get the things we don't think they get. There are some hard things to accept here, and this is one. We have groomed generations with inappropriate jokes, references, and unfettered access to some of the most disturbing and traumatic things humanity has to offer. Don't confuse someone's trauma response of tuning out the fucked up world around them with oblivion. They may just be that way because they get it. Arrogant. It's hard to have a generation lead when it comes to technology and not have them get cocky. How do we turn to the under 30 crowd to help us with setting everything up and then not expect them to feel like they're holding our hands, even though we have all the experience in life? Uh, we just can't turn the thing on. 
unrealistic. <laughs> this is where it leads into my next episode, but let's just say that when you have YouTuber or TikToker as career goals, you don't need a trail of breadcrumbs to lead you to the old witch's candy-coated wood-burning stove of reality. Reality TV. The blurring of lines between the fanatic four, fact, fiction, faith, and finance. Since the 70s, Americans have been targeted with televangelism, propaganda, all too real entertainment media, and rampant commercialism. All of that was before the internet. Since the 80s, children have been exposed to those same messages and more. For nearly a half century, we've pulled on the string of America's social sweater of reality until we're left with two generations at least who don't know what to think. The fall cons for conspiracy theories in a world where you know, just about anything could be true, so why not, right? And that's really it. Our reality's been tampered with. And who tampers with reality? Narcissists. And it's really hard for narcissism to not transfer. It's like a cancer. There's the word that we often don't want to associate with young people especially with our own children. And it seems to get overused today. Well, at least we're told it gets overused, mostly by those who are guilty of it and deflecting that onto others, which is a trademark trait of narcissism. So imagine if we could separate our bias and just observe children, those who are old enough to consume media and monitor their behaviors. I know we're treading into Jeepers Creepers getting the ice cream truck territory, but I assure you this is solely a mental exercise to get us thinking about the things in ways that we aren't normally permitted to consider. One of those ways is looking at children collectively as a culture, with some exceptions and room for nuance, that overall there are some very narcissistic tendencies present. Some mental stuff you inherit, some mental stuff you're conditioned into. Chicken and egg, that all you want. It's human nature, I think. Is it to be narcissistic? Or is that something we've developed as a result of our cultural choices and development? Understand that I'm talking about clinical narcissism, going down a checklist, a questionnaire to get an armchair diagnosis before going to a professional for actual assessment. I mean, I'm talking about bigger, cultural personalities here. Where do you find a therapy couch that big? I'm talking about things like self-centered behavior, superficiality, the self-serving actions, but I'm also going darker. Manipulation, gaslighting, tearing others down strategically so one feels better, building others up strategically just so one could enjoy watching them fall. Lying to ourselves and everyone around us, twisting the facts as they happen, distorting reality to suit and maintain a self-serving narrative. Indulgence and overindulgence, only to blame everyone else around them for their troubles. Wait, I, I mean, I know it sounds like I'm blaming everyone else for society's problems, but the issue is we were sold a bill of goods without reading the fine print. We agreed to the terms and conditions with no regard for the consequences. We got hit with the hidden fees. And with this level of social programming, I'm afraid there is no return policy. Let's just hope the service after the sale is better than it's been so far. The fact is, we don't know the far-reaching ramifications of the constant stream of, well, streaming. Everything always, all the time in our faces, anytime we want it, and even when we don't. We just get used to it because that's the cost of playing the game. We want to play the game. More. We gotta have more stuff. More apps. More connections. More likes. More... Social media currency isn't even dollars and cents. It's likes, shares, subs, followers. It's reaction and interaction. It's as fake as the money we swipe or chip. There's literally no gold in Fort Knox, and here there's figuratively no gold in Fort Knox. There is no inherent value in any of that. You can't pay your bills and hearts and comments. 
Look, Miss Landlord, I have $286, but I have 46,000 likes on this one video. We've spent decades arguing over the entitlements of society, the need for adequate and affordable access to health care, the need for affordable and accessible education. We've spent decades arguing over whether or not mental health should be covered and whether any of that hullabaloo is real anyhow. Prayer can fix just about anything, right? <laughs> We've spent years arguing about wage stagnation and how the cost of well, everything has gone up but nothing more than exponentially rising costs of keeping up with the Joneses. Again, 300,000 units of that first video game system sold in the early 70s, closing in on a billion Nintendo DS as of September 2022. Meanwhile, we've settled for cashing in all our chips for arbitrary emojis, bits of coin, and not fucking tangibles. We stare into the abyss of other people's lives, soaking in other people's ideas, or we're just zoning out of the slapstick laugh track to drown out our own internal tears. I've talked a lot about kids in this episode, but in this regard, we're all kids. We're all children, toddlers who have been read Lord of the Flies a little too many times, maybe by somebody with a bothersome perspective on it. Social media should have not only connected we the people, but it should have also united us had we been appropriately prepared for that progress. Some knew it was coming. The preparations instead were for how we can make it profitable. Meanwhile, we sell our souls to the lowest common denominator, forming our opinions with only partial information, then allowing that opinion to dictate almost every aspect of our lives. How many single-issue voters do you know? But it transcends politics. This is at the core of the culture of cultism I've been exploring. We are categorized and compartmentalized, herded into this pen or that pen. You're jeering or cheering. You're voting people off the island. You're changing channels. Maybe you already have. You're tuning out, slowly disconnecting yourself from reality, from your critical thinking, from your empathy, dumbing down numbing down. Don't go toward the light, as the static plays on the old 80s style television. There is no aftercare for the raw dogging America got and the assault left on our collective psyches. There is no gauge for the exposure to countless extreme stimuli. We simply see the results before us. I might argue that moving forward, our compensation, our reparations for what they have done to us, would be the free education we all need to re-educate us out of what garbage they've fed us. We all should have covered mental health care when we need it. That's the least they can do. And of course, compensate us for the invaluable data we accrue for them day in and day out. There are terms and conditions to using these apps, this tech, and they will always apply. It's our job to read the fine print and understand the hidden fees. There is no return policy, and the service after the sale sucks as bad as my non-existent retirement plan. Caveat emptor indeed, friends. Buyer beware. Coming up, I'm deconstructing my own social media self-destruction. From Facebook famous to TikTok trauma, YouTube to Twitter, and everything in between, I'm breaking down my deliberate attempt to manipulate my own algorithm, followers, friends, family, and fans. I'm going to explain how I had a path of guaranteed social media success if I wanted it. How I chose a different path, just because I was curious. I've always sort of been an armchair social scientist. I took most of the classes, but didn't want the major because uh, who the hell makes a living as a sociologist, am I right? <laughs> and it seems silly since I did want to get a mass communications major, but that sociology minor that comes in handy when deconstructing almost every post, comment, and content I've put out there. Yes, yeah, some of it's just been for my own mental masturbatory self-pleasure, I suppose, but Seeing the comments and the reactions to the things I've said and how I've deliberately and meticulously said them has been revealing. 
this next episode, The Great Social Media Experiment, chronicles my perspective and experience on social media. But it's really about us. I'm not just sharing what I've learned about me or society or culture, but I've discovered some pretty disturbing realities of our favorite sources of social media entertainment. You won't believe some of what I've found. It's definitely disturbing. And more so, we've all done it to ourselves. I'm analyzing the costs and benefits of making you famous next as I'm deconstructing a culture of cultism. Thanks for joining me. Check out some of my other videos on YouTube. I've got all my original music under my Sir Talks A Lot moniker, all of uh, my old TikToks, all of Overthinking Everything, clips of my acting and voiceover work organized in playlists for you. Check out my merch store and get your Sir Talks A Lot Swags A Lot swag. Follow me on Instagram, Facebook, like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Do all the things I need you to do, and if you like this series, consider a donation to Cash App. I'm Josh Brandon, and I'm overthinking everything. <laughs>